This is it, fellas. This is the culmination of two months worth of hard work. Hopefully this is gonna result in what I would consider to be the ultimate tool review. The review that at least I would like to see. So it's TTR, Testing, Teardown, and Review. So we're gonna start off with some solo tests using the tool. We're gonna to use these tests to evaluate the performance and the ergonomics. And then we're gonna do a teardown. With the teardown, we're gonna check out the build quality, the electronics, and is there anything innovative about this specific tool. And at the end of the teardown, we're gonna do a review. And this review is gonna be a score. So I've always wanted to look at the two scores. I wanna see the different categories and the ratings. It's like a Doug score, but instead of a Doug score, it'll be a Jason score for tools specifically. Then to wrap it all up, we're gonna upload the review to the website, review.wfskills.com, where we can compare it to other tools. And my desire, my hope is that this can kind of become a community for tool lovers, for tool nerds like myself. And if you don't agree with my review, if you use this tool, you've had a good experience or a bad experience, I would love for you to leave your review right here. And then collectively, we can sort of create this interesting thing where we can discuss tools and, you know, be two people. Now, before we get into the teardown, which is, of course, my favorite part, let's see what this unit can do rip -ems wise so, Let me get my photo tachometer. We'll see if the box specs meets the bench specs. So 29.75, that's not too shabby. I think that's probably a little bit over what they said. 
Now for the fun part. Let's strip it down and see what it's working with. So popping the clamshell. Well, got a little bit more, more work to do here. So here we go. Once again, popping the clamshell. Come on now, don't make a fool of me. All right. So build quality, right? I mean, really all of these tools are about the same. I've taken lots and lots of them apart. Uh, this, the, so the, the poly, so the composite plastic they use to make just about every tool that I've ever seen is a PA6, uh, FP30, FR30. And what that is, is that's fiberglass reinforced nylon, 30% by weight. So they inject nylon or they inject fiberglass, uh, into the mold and that gives it the structural rigidity, rigidity, rigidity. And then they have this uh, over mold, and this is, I'm sure that this is TPS, because I've already looked at this too. And TPS is thermoplastic styrene. And what that is, is that's uh, nitrile rubber. So there are really two different uh, synthetic rubber compounds that make the bulk of these over molds. And nitrile rubber and butylene are, are the two bog standards. There are a few others. But those are the two that are on most tools. Uh, the nitrile rubber is not quite as soft. It's a little bit more durable. But what nitrile rubber was originally designed for is a substitute to uh, latex. So people that break out in hives, um, they make nitrile rubber gloves. It's sort of a substitute for latex. It's durable. It's just not quite as soft as the butyl rubber. Um, these tools also have nitrile rubber. Um, the Milwaukee tools, this is butyl. And you can tell the difference because the butyl is darker, almost a black color, where these are sort of a grayish, you know, darker black. Um, there's a lot of complicated structural geometry in these tools, in the rigid specifically, but rigid, uh, Wilk Dickey, and the Ryodium, they're all made by TTI. These are big corporate conglomerate overlords, tool monsters. They control like 30% of the global tool market. Uh, I don't know if the tools are actually manufactured in the same facility, but the design is very, very similar across the board. You can see this, these structural um, components to it. You can see uh, there's this closed cell foam for impact resistance. And there's all these indexing points for the electronics. It's a good part. It's stiff. You know, there's some meat around the edges. I like it. I've really, really kind of fallen in love with Ryobi. I used to be a Dewalt guy, but after testing these Ryobis, man, they're tough as heck. And I've rode this too hard as the Dickens a couple of times, put it up quite wet, and it's bounced back. Like the rigid, um, I wore its ass out one day, and it never fully recovered. But this too did. Very interesting. This is probably my favorite uh, entry-level impact driver. So the potentiometer, another very interesting thing, and it's got, see, it's got these bellows. This prevents ingress of dust, so dust doesn't get into your potentiometer. Uh, what a potentiometer is, is basically it measures the resistance. So as you stroke into it, uh, it sends a signal through this ribbon cable, and then this is the integrated uh, brains, the board. Uh, it's potted on both sides, very similar design to the super uber high-end rigid. Uh, these with all the buttons and the lights. This is probably the most complicated impact driver I have ever seen. Uh, the only kind of chintzy cheap parts of it is you have these nickel plated probably uh, terminals where the battery connects. I'm also not particularly fond of these batteries because they're unnecessarily heavy. They got a lot of extra girth, you know, on the dingus end right here sticking out it's not necessary and it adds extra weight to the battery um, the motor is high quality got a lot of power um, it stinks out quite quite a good bit of power uh, top end over 500 watts which compared to the dewalt atomic which i would you know those are basically the two entry-level competitors that from home depot you'd either get this or you'd get the the uh the uh, Dewalt Atomic, and I believe this is a superior tool, in my opinion. 
you know, I try not to play favorites. I like Dewalt. I've got lots of Dewalt tools, but I believe, in my opinion, this is a superior unit. As you can see, this is a modular brushless motor design. Uh, there's a few balancing caps sticking out the butt end of this uh, of the circuit board. Another interesting part of this circuit board, and this is the almost an identical design again to the rigid, where the um, Hall effect sensors to control the positioning of the rotor. So the way that these brushless motors work is there's a, a permanent magnet rotor inside of the stator, and the stators, of course, these uh, armatures and the armatures have wires wrapped around it. Um, the difference between brushless and brushed is for brushed motors, uh, the internal has a lot more moving mass, right? Because the internal is the armature where the external of brushless motors is sort of represents the armature. Uh, much more efficient design. Uh, and like I was saying, this is a modular. So the whole thing is built together, which is interesting and kind of rare in the world of low-end tools. Normally... The motors are, you can kind of pop the motors apart. And then of course this one's got the uh, point up headlight instead of the tri-beam, which I would consider that to be a kind of a cheaper solution than the triple beam headlights. Um, it's totally not a bad motor and it's a censored motor too. And the way we know that it's censored, well, first of all, Sensored motors have these ribbon cables and the sensored motors also what sensored motor means is means there's three Hall effect sensors Hall effect sensors what they do is they determine the position of magnetic fields So as the rotor turns there's a rotary encoder in these Hall effect sensors What that does is it communicates with the low relative position of the motor based on the trigger pull and you don't have to have sensors Contrary to popular belief, all brushless motors are not sensor. See, this is a high performance RC motor and it does not have the Hall effect sensors. It just has the three phase uh, wires going to it. And I believe this is three phase DC. Uh, we could check that. We might check that, but you can see this uh, heat sink sticking out the bottom. And of course the Hall effect sensors are in the front side of it. But what makes Hall Effect Sensors motors good is it gives you very precise control of the speed of the motor. Like if you don't have Hall Effect Sensors, see you get this very granular control of the speed of the motor. Um, and you also get high speed too. They say that there's an efficiency loss, sort of a parasitic loss. Um, from these censored motors, but I'm not sure about that. So we're not going to be able to measure it. Hold on, I'll show you the difference between censored and censorless motors. Now, let me show you the difference between censorless versus censored. And these motors, they straight up get down, son. But you just don't have nearly as precise as granular control over the sensorless motors as you do the sensor. So let me show you. So that's as slow as I can get it to go. So you don't have nearly as precise control. But you do, but these, you know, these sensorless motors do exist, contrary to popular belief. Okay, so back to what we were talking about. Now this is an interesting design and I would say this is a fairly expensive. You only see these on the more premium models where this is a um, cast aluminum housing for the uh, hammer assembly, right? So let's uh, pop these pins out, take a look at what we got. A lot of this too really, really reminds me of the uh, much more expensive rigid octane. It's, the design is remarkably similar. The cast aluminum housing for the, um, for the 
sticky do for the diddly do for the uh, hammer assembly here. And then of course it's got this uh, this milled face for the fitment. Quite an expensive part to make. But the thing, an, in, an interesting part of this, now that we're inside of it, is they didn't do, they didn't use molybdenum disulfide. They used this cheap, like, old axle grease. Uh, the molybdenum is expensive. I remember we used to buy tubes of it for the railroad. It was like 24 bucks for a, for a tube. Um, and this is just axle. Molly lube is much more expensive, but it's normally designed, from what I was understood, it was designed for high pressure, high temperature gearboxes, which I don't think these get all that particularly hot. Um, but you can see it's a single speed reduction, and these are powdered metal gears. Um, not very, not super expensive, but that's, you know, they all across the board. And here we have a red Buna End O ring. And the reason that these O rings are colored is they are designed to avoid these erroneous errors in placing. So if you take one O-ring and then you pop it out and you put another O-ring in, O-rings are different. They're, they're made of different things. Uh, red is neoprene normally. It also could potentially be uh, silicone. And then, of course, the way these things work is you have these, uh, you have the hammer assembly that rotates. I have a video that really showcases how these things operate. It's got a single speed reduction. You have the ring gear, and then you have um, the pinion coming off the motor. The pinion spins these little planetaries, and then the planetaries make contact with the ring gear here, and then that speed reduction rotates the hammer right here. The hammer under overcomes the spring tension, and it makes impact with this unit down in here. See, it hits it like a hammer. And this, this is the anvil. And then that's, the impact is what imparts the kinetic energy into the bit. So it's a great design, loud as heck, but it's a great design. Uh, most of all impact drivers use this same design. Uh, But another thing that I've noticed that's sort of a cheaper, some of these, or quite a few of the higher end ones, they have three planetaries. You can see that this is, this is actually a fairly high end, um, the housing for the planetaries, the gear set housing, but some of them have three or even four planetaries. So they cheaped out a little bit on that. It also makes it difficult to sort of center it when we're trying to put the tool back together. Uh, but an expensive cast aluminum housing. And of course you can see the surface milling for fitment. And the last thing that's kind of interesting about this tool is um, it's got the auto coupling auto chuck it also squirts the bit out so it's got all the bells and whistles I really like this drill a lot I mean you know they gave it a nice powerful motor they cut corners but of course they did this is one of the cheapest drills made Now the last part, the coolest part, the part that I think is going to make these videos sort of unique uh, in comparison to all the other review videos that exist on the YouTube, and that is the score. So performance, this is a great performing tool. I would give it a 7. Uh, it's about 500 watts, you know, close to 0.7 horsepower in comparison to a lot of other impact drivers. That's on the higher end. It's you know, it's not a low end, it's not a high end, but it's, you know, squarely in the middle, maybe a little above the middle. Ergonomics, this is not a very comfortable tool. It's heavy, unwieldy. Um, the design, I mean, it, it, I'm inclined to believe that they actually tried to make this thing uncomfortable. So they wouldn't compete so much with the Milwaukee and the Rigid. 
the build quality, you know. So I gave it a seven in performance, a 5.5 in ergonomics. The build quality is a solid seven. I mean, it's a quite sturdy tool. There's no parts like the design of the actual components, the electronics. Uh, it's remarkably similar to the extremely high-end Rigid Octane, which is one of the most expensive uh, impact drivers that you can buy. Uh, the design is remarkably similar to that, actually. So I give it a 7 in build quality. I've also, like I said, uh, I rode this drill very hard. I have, I mean, it's farted out its last breath, and then it came back to life, whereas I had a Rigid brushed, and I did the same, and when it gave out, like I completely ran it to failure, and the rigid never fully recovered. It was sick every for, forever, and you know it never fully recovered. Where this tool, I ran it just as hard until it just quit working, and then it like it seemed to bounce back completely after like ten minutes. It came back to life. Uh, so I give it a 6.5 in electronics. You know, the electronics are good. They're not great, but they're above average. Uh, innovation, 5.5. There's nothing particularly innovative about this tool. It's just sort of your basic impact driver. Uh, and then total is a 6.7, which is that's above average in my opinion. Uh, this is a fantastic little tool. Like I said before, I think this is the best budget impact driver money can buy. The only other one that I could say comes close to this is the brushed rigid. Now the next step up would be like the Dewalt Max, uh, the Makita, but I want to review all of those. So this is the first review of the TTR format. I hope you guys liked it. I, I love doing this. I'm a tool nerd. I love tools and I love sharing this passion with everybody else. So if you want to, Please go to our website, review.wfskills.com. Check it out. Leave your review, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.